Hi everyone. Good evening and welcome to the CEO um, series um, this evening. And thank you for dialing in. Today we have a very special program about the chapter launch for the IAOIP and APU uh, Malaysian student chapter. Before I begin with more details, allow me to give a background about International Association of In Innovation Professionals. The, Inno the International Association of Innovation Professionals is the world's only ISO 17024 compliant innovation certification body and fully networked community to deliver innovation tools and collaboration across nations, industry, governments, and academia. IAOIP's innovation certifications validate that the holder has the proven tools to drive meaningful innovations and the related results and successes in their organizations, community, and world. IAOIP's Academy provides members with the latest in innovation training, and IAOIP is the U.S. Technical Advisory Group for ISO 279, developing and driving the global standards in innovation, setting the bar for innovation going forward. I would like to invite Dr. Hari, the president of Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation, to say a few words as the opening for our session this evening. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Bay. And uh, a, a very good morning to our, our colleagues from the US. I think it's what, six o'clock in the morning. Um, thank you for joining us so early in the morning and good evening to all our colleagues um, in uh, Asia Pacific University. Um, I was just recalling um, when uh, Bay asked me about saying a few words uh, for this uh, uh, launch of the chapter and uh, it took me back a few months ago uh, when when we had the discussion I think it was uh, Dr. Subang who had introduced uh, uh, the IOP uh, to us and uh, we were both uh, Vinish and I had some discussions on it and says uh, what would the strategic benefits be but I think that in the after the first call with uh, I believe it was Frank Rick and uh, Subang that we were thoroughly convinced that uh, we should be part of the International Association of Innovation Professionals. Uh, it, it, the, the, there are strategic reasons why we're doing that, and I think there are mutual benefits for both. Um, if you look at Asia Pacific University, it's not just Asia Pacific University, the title has Asia Pacific University of Technology and Innovation. And I remember, Vinesh, that over the last few months in our leadership meeting, uh, our founder, uh, Dr. Panjit, had talked about in terms of putting uh, kind of more focus on the innovation. Of, obviously, we've been very focused on technology. we got to get more focused on the innovation area. And by the way, that's uh, one of the reasons strategically that Prof. Vinesh is now uh, the, the key lead in driving innovation and in, 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 in enterprise uh, in this organization. So strategically, we felt that this is the right partnership uh, with um, IAOIP. And um, the other long-term uh, strategy that we have is the fact that, you know, we want to be uh, the, I guess, the uh, the premier institution for innovation and, and, and be certified uh, through the ISO standards. It's, it's a long haul flight, if I call it. It will take some time for us to do it. But I, but I felt that, you know, this is a first step towards collaborating and partnering uh, with this association. And, and I must thank uh, Rick, Frank and, and Subang um, to help us, you know, come to this particular stage. And of course, uh, Vinish has been driving this uh, with the team over here. Um, I'm told that with the collaboration, we have about six of our staff uh, that are going to be uh, more closely associated uh, with this particular drive. And we have got about 20 students in the in the chapter. 
Uh, this is a start and we hope that we will have more uh, staff uh, participating uh, in this particular initiative. Uh, I, I, I saw that we're going to be very focused on FYP projects uh, associated with uh, SDG kind of uh, areas, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, one of the other initiatives that Prof. Vinesh has been driving over the last year and a half is in terms of uh, drive, kind of driving, uh, at, you know, the, the mentality of entrepreneurialism among uh, the, the students that we have in Asia Pacific University. And uh, there's been a lot of focus, there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, strategic drive that we are having at this point in time. And I'm definitely sure that as we as we continue to work with this association, there'll be more, I guess, um, benefits uh, in uh, as we drive the uh, the enterprise and entrepreneurism among the students and so forth. By the way, uh, I think the module two in level two is associated with innovation. So strategically, it's very important for us to have this partnership, and uh, it is a start with the chapter. And uh, I have been introduced to the resources that this association has is significant. And I think that it's not just the tools and resources, it's also the human resources, yeah? Uh, with the amount of significant experiences that this association members have, we do hope to benefit from that, not just the staff, also the students. With that, I'll hand it over to Bay. And uh, I hope that this launch will be a very successful launch and we will see more students participating in this particular uh, chapter. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Hari, for the very um, inspiring speech. Um, obviously, I mean, um, you have set the context right um, by sharing with us what is the guiding compass and directions um, in terms of um, what, where should the uni should APU be heading to. Um, thank you very much uh, for the very inspiring words again. Thank, thank you, you. Bay. Thanks for organizing this. Thank you. Right. Next, um, I would like to invite um, Professor Vinish, um, the Chief Innovation and Enterprise Officer um, from the Asia-Pacific University of Technology and Innovation um, to share with us um, what does it mean um, and to share with us more about on the APU and IAOIP chapter formation. Prof. Vinish. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bay, and uh, a very good morning to our American counterparts, uh, and a uh, very good evening to everyone watching from Malaysia. Uh, uh, it's been a, a great day today, uh, thus far, and uh, uh, we've been blessed with the IAOIP uh, uh, APU launch. Uh, and I want to say a few things uh, with regards to uh, where we have gone uh, in terms of uh, the planning and, and what we have plan to execute uh, in the coming future. So let me share with you some slides. Yeah, I hope you can see my slides. Can you see my slides? Yeah, okay. So uh, as a start, let me uh, very quickly uh, uh, brief you on the, uh, the setup of the structure. So, the IAOIP uh, is basically uh, been set up in a way whereby there is the standards of Malaysia uh, chapter uh, or, or a mirror committee in terms of uh, TC11 ISO 56000. Uh, and I am part of that as well, uh, together with uh, Dr. Ku So Bing. Uh, but for the formation of the, the the student representation and in the Malaysian chapter as well. Uh, we have the Malaysian chair, uh, which is myself, 
but before that, uh, we have advisors. Yeah, so Dr. Hari himself uh, from APU and uh, Mr. Tan Eng Tong from PSDC are uh, advisors into the uh, Malaysian uh, uh, chapter. I'm the Malaysian chair. Uh, and then we have the vice chair, who's uh, Dr. Ko Subing. And then we have uh, a few committees. So we have uh, Dr. Bay, who is the secretariat. Uh, and then we split the committee uh, with uh, some uh, who are from APU. So we have uh, Associate Professor Dr. Tang Kafe, who is the uh, the head of uh, the senior head for technology uh, at uh, APU. Then we have uh, John, uh, who's from Gamuda, who's also uh, spearheading uh, innovation at Gamuda, uh, which is a, a prime and a, a top uh, tier one uh, construction firm in, in Malaysia. And then we have uh, Dr. Vinodini, uh, who has been a, a, a techie uh, and a senior lecturer with us at APU. And then, of course, we have the student chapter chair, where at the moment we have 20 students who are part of this uh, student chapter. Uh, what we want to move forward in the coming future is set up representation in the northern, central, and southern, and eastern uh, part of Malaysia. Within the, uh, the APU uh, IAOIP setup, uh, we have uh, six professional members who are now part of uh, IAOIP. Uh, so as I said earlier, there's Dr. Tang, Dr. Vinodini. Then we have Abi Rami, who's uh, very uh, uh, close knit with the student uh, group. We have uh, Ui Ai Kong, uh, also known as Ikang, who's also very close with the student uh, group in terms of uh, innovation projects, uh, myself and Dr. B as well. Yeah. So this is, uh, in summary, uh, a very uh, good structure uh, which we have formulated and we put in place uh, to move uh, the, uh, the entire playbook or the entire uh, vision for the future. Now, in terms of uh, value creation, uh, as an institution, uh, we will only club uh, research and innovation together because that's a perfect uh, marriage. So. In terms of pillars, uh, we have uh, four pillars, and all of these pillars uh, move towards uh, a three-year plan uh, to get us into the, the momentum and into the driving seat. So the first year, uh, which was last year, we already started in terms of consolidation. Uh, in 2022, which is this year, we are intensifying. Uh, and in 2023, we will uh, maintain uh, and, and sustain our, our position. Now, the four pillars are research and publication, which we intend to start with the strategic framework uh, and the research center uh, realignment with the people that has been done. Uh, this year, we are focusing on grant applications and, and publications and in enriching uh, social sciences as well uh, to go along with our forte, which is technology. Uh, in, in 2023, you want to ensure that a lot of the innovation and the publications that are aligned towards the innovation in terms of research and innovation are, for, are formed in a one-to-one -one ratio uh, against the staff uh, at APU. Now, in terms of networking industry, uh, we have must we have a consolidated our master list of who to partner with. Uh, we have enough liaison support. Uh, we have all the collaborative documents in place in terms of partnership uh, from a legal perspective. And then we also are starting to preach uh, and already implemented industry on campus. After that, we'll move to increase uh, our expertise on, on site. Uh, we will have our research centers uh, more industry oriented, uh, align the FIPs towards uh, innovation uh, as per the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, and ensure that dissertations are also part of that uh, outcome, uh, and then intensify uh, industry on campus. Now, uh, in 2023, we forecast uh, the research centers to be in more industry oriented and the final year project bank to have about 25% of them uh, projects uh, to be more uh, uh, innovation and sustainable development uh, orientated. Yeah. Uh, in terms of innovation and commercialization, uh, we are already uh, streaming a lot of our awards towards innovation. Uh, but this year, what we have done is we've also done a, a strategic evaluation and guidance towards that. Uh, and then we propel them into startups uh, moving into 2023. But most of these startups have already started uh, in 2021, but getting them into gear into more uh, more of a uh, commercialized outcome uh, in 2023. 
Now, in terms of ecosystem, we have the strategic playbook in place. Uh, and then we are now also uh, moving towards uh, the APU sandbox, uh, which is being intensified uh, by Dr. Bay. And lastly, in 2023, we will then have extensions to the industry on campus, which has already also started. Yeah. So this is uh, the value creation in terms of research and innovation. Uh, in terms of innovation teams, uh, we have uh, only one area, uh, which is a very general area, which is to actually push uh, the, the entire vision and mission towards attaining sustainable development goals. Yeah? So we have uh, outlined uh, six teams within the SDG uh, based on our forte, based on the expertise we have, and based on what we have done uh, previously in terms of projects. So we have healthcare and well-being, uh, which addresses uh, SDG 3, quality education as an institution, SDG 4, clean energy, SDG 7, sustainable and smart city developments, SDG 11, uh, responsible consumption and production, SDG 12, and industrial partnerships, which are SDG 17. So we have a direct alignment with the SDGs. Uh, in terms of uh, as a university and our forte and the people that are involved with the IOIP chapter, uh, we want to focus on global technology applications. So we're talking about smart products such as drones, uh, voice recognition and uh, the application of NLP, uh, artificial intelligence and analytics using machine learning, and then the virtual reality and augmented reality, uh, which goes into extended reality into the new uh, form of metaverse. Uh, also, cybersecurity and digital forensics, which is uh, our forte in terms of uh, the setup and in infrastructure we have, and robotics and uh, robotic process uh, automation, which is also a very keen uh, ingredient in terms of uh, technology applications across the board. Yeah, so in short, these are uh, the, the plan, uh, and this is not a, a, an open plan, it's a plan which has been written based on a playbook and a blueprint, uh, which has already started uh, back in 2021. All right, thank you very much, Prof Vinish, for sharing with us um, the framework in terms of the uh, innovation framework for I from APU, right? And what does it mean that having this structure in place and the, and, and the framework setting the they basically how to operationalize uh, and what does it mean uh, when it comes to the different level of research and you know um, the re different research center and um, the, the plots that you know each of the respective stakeholders will have uh, within APU. Now um, I would like to invite um, Dr. Brad Tasco, the president and CEO of IAOIP, sharing with us the uh, overview of IOIP, and with that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Brad. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, so uh, I just turned on my slides, and it says I have to allow it because I'm using a Mac. So unfortunately, that holds me up for just a moment. Loud and clear, Brad. OK. Um, Great. Can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Um, no, Brad. Yes, unfortunately, it's uh, requiring me to shut off Chrome and come back in, which means I'd have to leave the conference and come back. So I think we're going to go without slides for me. Um, because that obviously wouldn't work. So I'll look at my slides, uh, but you won't be able to see them. So thank you for uh, inviting me. And I'm really excited for this opportunity to work together. Um, I have to say that uh, when we started the association, we, we kind of started it in a humble way. Um, we didn't intend to be extremely aggressive or uh, take over the world or make a lot of money. So we 
form, form the association as a nonprofit. Um, and I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, my background real quick to, to kind of know where we came from. Um, I started out as a biologist, then an accountant, uh, became a management consultant, started my own consulting firms, uh, started a dot com at the end of 2000. I was a futurist. For those of you that know what a futurist is, basically, I studied trends and I made money uh, working with companies and going to conferences and trying to predict what the world might be like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, etc. Um, and then uh, sold my dot com just prior to 9-11 and uh, came back to KPMG. I'll, everyone probably knows KPMG Consulting, where I uh, eventually became a partner and I actually had global responsibility for everything, business process reengineering and um, Six Sigma, Lean. And, you know, you find in you find in um, innovation a lot of people who have migrated uh, for better or for worse from process reengineering because there's a lot of same tools we use. Um, and that's what uh, a lot of people have missed in innovation. And I'm working with the U.S. Navy. And every time I come to a client or to a conference, everyone says, well, you know, innovation and it's it's just creativity and it's just using your imagination. What's the big deal? Um, but as we talk about ISO 56000, what you find out is that, uh, in fact, you can't do innovation without the science side of it. So early on, and uh, when you get the uh, GISH, the Global Innovation Science Handbook, um, we started something that we called innovation science was what we, we worked on. This was actually a, a, a term that uh, Joe Nadan, Professor Joe Nadan at NYU had coined, and he was one of our early founders. Um, and so when you look at, say, a slide deck where I'm uh, presenting, on the one side you have innovation as an art, and on the other side you have innovation as a science. And they need to meld because without an innovation management system, innovation doesn't work. Then it's just a bunch of ideas that get you know thrown in a suggestion box and never managed or never taken care of. So we've got that creativity side of it, which is the art, and then we've got the science side of it, which is managing it like we would manage any other system. And that was really important to us from day one. Um, so how this evolved was uh, at, at one point uh, I was a partner and I'm very proud to say my wife was a partner at KPMG also. We had young children. It didn't make sense for both of us to be traveling nonstop. And uh, because I had uh, doctorates, I said, well, I'll go be a professor. And um, for, for those of, I'm, I'm not making fun of professors because I'm still a professor at uh, several universities, but uh, going from being a partner at a big consulting firm to being a professor uh, required a little less time, uh, definitely less travel. I got to come home every night. And so I found myself with a little bit of extra time. And this was around 2007. And so at that point, uh, I was looking at what was happening with innovation. And the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge was that I actually was sitting in front of the television and noticed that um, and noticed that there was a lot of commercials where everyone was touting how they were so innovative. And, and the one that really got me was there was a fruit company. I don't remember which one it was. And they said they were the most innovative fruit company. And I said, how do you innovate in fruit? Do you make purple bananas? Is that is that how that you innovate? Because it wasn't clear to me. And so I became very concerned uh, because, as probably most of you on this call know, maybe not the students, um, but you should ask your professors about it. Six Sigma was a really big deal in the 90s and into the 2000s. I had a lot of work as a consultant uh, in Six Sigma. Um, but then the companies didn't do it right. They, they kind of did it tongue in cheek. They didn't uh, follow the, the formula. And they started failing and, and then they started abandoning it and saying, you know, Six Sigma doesn't work and it's just a, a big waste of time. And I was fearful that innovation was going to happen the same way. Um, so I started looking around and the first thing I noticed was there was really no, uh, there was no, there were kind of academic journals that talked about innovation, but not really. So uh, I set out, you know, being naive set out to uh, start an academic journal, and that's the International Journal of Innovation Science, founded in 2008, 2007. I think we're on the 14th edition now. 
Uh, that's one of the things when you become a member of the association, you have access to the entire database of all the journals, uh, articles that have ever been published. We have an impact factor that rides above three for those academics on the phone. And so it's, uh, it's considered a legitimate journal. Um, and everywhere where I talk here, if you hear something interesting, uh, I'm going to kind of skip forward for a second. But the, the association was always meant to be member run, member managed, member founded. Um, we've been in existence now for 10 years. Um, none of us get paid. We're all volunteers. We have no paid staff. So if you see something you want to do and you want to help out with, please feel free to do it. I may ask you to do that later on. Uh, so then we got up to 2013 and I had been publishing the journal for a while and I kept getting executives say, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm having problems with identifying innovation professionals. Um, the story kind of went like this to paraphrase is I, hi, I, I did a search for someone. I found somebody that said they were an expert at innovation. They ran my innovation department for two years. I fired them because they didn't get anything done. And now between their salaries, the search and the severance for getting rid of them, I'm out of half a million dollars. Can you help me by telling me who's good at innovation, who knows innovation and who's just, you know, spouting off? And I said, no, I really couldn't tell you that. Uh, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can start uh, looking at, at creating a standard for it. And I had come out of Oasis, for those of you in technology, the Organization for the Advancement of Structured Information Standards. Even while I was at KPMG, um, I was uh, employed by them part time. And so I was very familiar with how standards worked, how to get things done under standards, uh, basically methodologies. And so I got together with uh, with a couple of uh, gentlemen and we founded the association. Uh, this was, like I said, around 2008, and we've seen roughly a doubling in our membership every year. Um, so now we have about 4,500 members, 4,000 members. I can't keep track in about 120 countries. So at about the same time, we pu published the Global Innovation Science Handbook. And because of a lack of uh, basically resources, because we were small, the first year we only had 70 members and the next year we had about 140 members. We just didn't have the resources to start and create, uh, say, a three ring binder full of all the standards, which we're still kind of moving in that direction. Um, so I, 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 with Praveen Gupta, published uh, the Global Innovation Standards Handbook. You'll hear it referred to as GISH. Um, I've published a number of other books. Uh, I published one on uh, Six Sigma and healthcare. Uh, uh, Frank Vol is is on the line as well as Rick, and they kind of spearheaded uh, a three volume called the Innovation Tools Handbook. And then recently we published the Framework for Innovation. I shouldn't say recently; it's actually been about two or three years now. But time flies, as we know. Um, trying to discuss the innovation management system and uh, the body of knowledge. So this thing is constantly evolving and this is the way we meant it to be because we learn new things all the time. You just look at the academic papers and you see the evolution. Um, sustainability is obviously a big deal. And, um, and I, like I said, I still work as a professor, so I, I have to do that. Um, so about the Journal of Innovation Science, I'm always looking for new editors. Uh, Dr. Subang is one of our associate editors on the journal. We publish 40,000, we publish 40 issues or 40 papers a year, which for those of you who are involved in academic journals knows that's a pretty heavy uh, load, which means uh, I think we, we receive about 200 to 250 papers a year. So that puts us at about, uh, you know, a pretty small acceptance level. Papers are getting great, better. Uh, we consider it interdisciplinary as long as you're writing about the process of innovation, not um, an innovative way to, to do something. It's more the process of innovation. Every now and then, other papers sneak in, but generally speaking, that's our goal. Uh, it's indexed everywhere. Uh, it's got an impact factor that's uh, quite respectable for the age of the journal. And um, periodically, we do special issues. So currently, we have a special issue coming out of... Uh, European innovation uh, from a conference that's taking place in Portugal. 
And then we've got a, uh, a sustainability issue that we're trying to schedule. So if you've got, uh, if you're trying to do an academic conference or something, we could publish some proceedings in the journal um, for APU. Um, it's every everything standard, the editorial board, editors, uh, like I said, we're on volume 14, a double blind review from the reviewers, uh, three, three reviewers. It's pretty standard stuff for anyone who knows that stuff. Uh, and it's uh, like I said, it's online available for free with your membership. It's a little convoluted how to get to it. But if you go to the YouTube channel, you can actually see the instructions for how to get to the papers. And there's probably close to 500 academic papers in there that are available to you now. Of course, as a university, it might already be in your library, but I find that the publishers sell packets of journals. And so there is a possibility that it's not in your library. So you can go get all of those for free. Uh, if you had a subscription, you'd pay about $500 a year. Um, and of course, any back, at, uh, back issues, you'd have to pay about $30 a piece for the paper. So this is a really great benefit in our opinion. Um, and, and we wanna make sure that that stays supported. Uh, on the Global Innovation Science Handbook, we basically took uh, uh, several sections, how to prepare your organization for innovation, uh, general concepts of innovation, creativity tools, idea management, innovation methodologies, types of innovations, measurements, deployment of innovation in your organization, uh, sustaining your return on innovation, which is kind of a play on return on investment. And then we have a few case studies in there. Uh, by the way, case studies are something that the journal is really interested in because what we'd like to do is, uh, I, for those of you that are teaching in innovation, you probably know that there's not enough good case studies that you can teach out of. And so if you've got a great case study about a company that's done it right, those are, those are definitely in demand. Um, we have 64 chapters in the book. It's a large book for those of you that uh, actually buy books anymore. Uh, I highly, highly recommend you buy the Kindle version instead because it's uh, much more manageable. It's about 900 pages. Um, so in, in the sections uh, under preparing, you know, how do you do your strategy? How do you prepare your culture for the organization? Um, how do you assess your ability to innovate? Um, in uh, the uh, general concepts, we talk about personal creativity, corporate creativity, et cetera. Um, I'd recommend you go take a look at the book. I'm trying to watch my time here, by the way, and my phone keeps uh, going out because I don't want to go over time for you. Um, so I won't get too much into the chapters, but if you go to the, the Kindle edition on, say, Amazon, you can see what's in the book. We think we covered pretty much everything, but uh, over time we've discovered there's some things missing. Uh, jobs to be done is missing. Um, business model canvas is missing. But those came out after we published the first edition. Uh, we're working on the second edition now, and, and we'll be picking up some of those tools. So if anybody um, actually wants to write a chapter for the book, please reach out to us uh, because we're always looking for more, more writers, uh, and you'll, you'll obviously get that writing credit. Uh, another reason we, we were looking at this, and, and part of the problem was, you know, we were looking at this industrial age executives. I, I like to tease in my classes that, you know, the best way to get innovation is to get rid of some of the old managers because they're driven and they were they were incentivized under uh, basically industry 3.0, right? Um, it was uh, people were highly specialized. And I'm of the opinion that one of the things we need to be more innovative is to develop more polymaths. And if that word's not familiar to some people, I use it because Renaissance man sounds, well, it's got the word man in it. And of course we have Renaissance women also, but a Renaissance person. Somebody like a Leonardo da Vinci who does art and science and languages and, and, and does a little bit of everything. Because I think that as an innovator, you need to have the ability to see across the whole organization, to understand a little engineering, to understand a little of this, a little of that. You don't have to be an expert. But we've hyper-specialized in our modern economy. And I think that actually goes against what we need to do to be innovative. Uh, very hierarchical structure. We've... And we see now the, the uh, uh, organizational charts flattening, uh, the changes in how leaders uh, uh, basically inter interface with their, the people they lead, much more humane, 
uh, much less threatening. And so we've got organizational structures that are going from very rigid, very uh, strong authoritarian type leadership to something more like a, just a big giant team or a big giant family. And I, I believe that um, a lack of balance, uh, work-life balance, uh, uh, balance in what you do in the organization, chances to learn other parts of the business. Uh, a focus on return on investment. I was a CFO for a while at a hospital. We didn't do a project unless it met the 20% return on investment, period. It didn't matter how good it was or that it might produce a lot of goodwill or revenue in five years or 10 years. If it didn't make the 20% return on investment, we just didn't do it. Anybody who's uh, very familiar with innovation knows that you know sometimes you take an innovation in and it doesn't really make a lot of money, but it's good for the company or it's good for the employees or something like that. Um, we uh, focused in this old industrial age on very sequential management that, uh, you know, if you wanted to get an approval, you had to have six, seven, eight signatures and you had to go up the hierarchy and down the hierarchy and you couldn't break and you couldn't loop back and your uh, feedback loops were essentially non-existent. And that's now changed as we all know. Uh, rigidity, uh, the hierarchical decision making, as I said. So what we see and what we don't even realize, I think at this point is innovation is changing a lot of the things that go on in our world, that go on in our companies, our educational process, our politics, and many things that we don't even understand yet. But it is going to happen and we so slowly see it coming out. I see it here working with the U.S. military, um, that the military is not what it used to be. It's, it's a different kind of military. Uh, it's a, a more understanding military. It's a more uh, empathetic military, if you can use uh, empathy and military in the same sentence without it being an oxymoron. One of the questions we were asked as we started out is, what is innovation? And you're going to hear this a lot. If you're working in innovation, they go, oh, that's just creativity. And some of you know that when I started working in the Middle East, the, the Middle East, North Africa, that in Arabic, uh, up until about 2016, the word innovation didn't exist. Instead, they used the word, the Arabic word for creativity, uh, iftar. Iftar, uh, please forgive me for any Arabic speakers on the phone. I, I'm drawing a blank. It's kind of early where I am. Um, but the word they used for innovation was creativity. So you can understand how people got confused between the difference between innovation and creativity. Uh, innovation being that art and that science. And we like to use a, a Venn diagram, which I too bad you can't see, which basically says the real sweet spot of innovation is somewhere where in the intersection of um, hard sciences, engineering, math, um, biology, et cetera, those hard sciences, the social sciences, uh, more specifically business, um, where, okay, you got this the scientists that come up with all these ideas, you've got to have something that you can actually then turn into a business. And then that softer side, the humanities. And so that intersection of humanities, business, and hard science, thus the humanities being design thinking, uh, asking the customers what they want, et cetera, is the, um, so you, when you hit that intersection, we consider that um, the innovation sweet spot. And of course, that also lends itself to that polymath kind of approach that uh, we like to talk about. So what innovation is, is different to a lot of people. And uh, part of what we found was that um, there was a lot of people out there that, um, that were preaching that they were teaching innovation, but not necessarily. And so one of our founders, Joe Nadan, he had students do, and this would have been around 2011, 2012, uh, did a international survey and found at that point in time about 300 universities and colleges that had innovation to programs, degrees or diplomas, but the vast majority of them didn't actually have an innovation program. As I mentioned earlier, they had, you're getting a, a BBA in accounting and innovation, and then you'd look at the curriculum, there wasn't a single innovation class in there. That's obviously changed, but that was part of our mission. Um, so we said we need to standardize innovation so that everybody's teaching uh, the same kind of topics. And that was, you know, that's always a challenge when you're introducing kind of a new discipline is, um, is 
having a standard of what to teach, the kind of classes that are standard to teach, et cetera, you guys are off to a good start, um, but that's part of what we supported. Um, so what we, uh, what we did was we asked the professional and academic community, and that was part of what the association was meant to do is to bring those communities together and say, companies, what do you want? And then feed that back to the academy. Academy, what do you think the companies need? and feeding that back in the other direction. It caused a little bit of, of, of tension in the beginning because frankly, uh, people said you're too academic or you're not academic enough. You can't satisfy everyone. So we formed the group, we named it, uh, we started looking for academic and corporate support. We created bylaws, all this stuff. But once again, member driven and member managed organization. So there's opportunities for anyone who wants to work in the association take responsibility. And that's what Dr. Sue Bang's done. Um, we created a certification. We follow ISO 17024. For those of you that don't know what that is, it is the, um, it's the management standard for organizations that certify individuals. Very uh, prescribed. It talks about, um, it talks about uh, separating, uh, for example, the certification program from it's, it's basically trying to do everything right. Um, there's a lot of organizations out there. I won't mention any of them. They throw out a certification, but all you know is that it was some group of people that got together in a room and said, this is what I think they should know. Under the 17024 process, you have to go through working groups. You have to have a lot of rigor in the development of it. And that's what we did, which makes us slower than some of these organizations out there that will throw certifications at you. Uh, which are typically for profit, et cetera. So we're fighting against that. And so having APU involved offers a lot of legitimacy to that 17024 process. And Frank Vole is responsible for that. Uh, then in 2015, we had the opportunity to grab the ISO 279 tag for the United States. Uh, ASQ had it. They couldn't get anybody to join, uh, which, you know, they were doing pure quality. And so I think Frank and Rick are going to talk more about ISO 279. Uh, there's been six guidance documents, standards, some people would call them, that have been published. They'll talk about that. I'm the secretariat, which means uh, Frank and Rick, as the chair and co-chair, do all the work, and I get all the glory. Um, thank you very much. Um, but uh, they'll also talk probably about the auditable standard that will be available in the next uh, 36 months. Um, the membership dues, uh, you can talk to, to Sue Bang about that, Dr. So Bang, everybody knows how to get a hold of him. And I very much appreciate, I'm out of time, uh, the opportunity to be here this morning. And I can't wait to, to work with the uh, really great uh, uh, academics over at APU. You've got a reputation that's worldwide. You've done a lot of things over the years that have been just outstanding. And so I have a feeling that I have a lot of opportunities to learn from you, just like well, we'll have all have opportunities to teach you things too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Brett. Um, before letting you go, uh, I think we have one question from the audience. Um, okay. In your opinion, in today's world, despite the state of the economy, ch change in culture and many other problems, what innovators do this world need more than anything else? Well, you know, I, I get back to that comment I made about um, the, that the world is changing and we have and, and we, we have all these people who are running these traditional management structures and don't know why their innovation doesn't work. Obviously, there's more to it than that. Um, but even with the military, trying to tell them to have more fun on their job to, you know, trying to tell a military officer to have more fun on their job is, is, is just crazy. They look at me like, well, you don't understand the military, but what I keep telling them is, you know, your recruiting is way down. And part of the reason is there's a lot of young people who work in technology and stuff and say, yeah, there's some benefits to going to someplace like the military or, a big company with a rigid hierarchical structure and, and, you know, 30 years to get your retirement. Um, but that's not the world we live in any longer. And you're going to have problems recruiting people. And so you've got to, um, you as, you know, the, the organizations need to come around, but you as an individual 
need to broaden your horizons. Just being uh, a bachelor's degree in computer science doing Python, guess what? In five years, Python's not even going to exist any longer. So you need to be in a state of continuous learning, uh, being trying as much as you can to read everything you can, become more of a polymath. Um, I mean, a big thing in innovation is biomimicry. And so I'm talking to military people, how many people go out camping and look at nature and try to come up with ideas? Almost none of them. And so it, it's like you have to expand your world. And this is good for the world. It's good for politics. It's good for cultures getting along, et cetera. So uh, go out there and experience life and bring it back to your organizations. All right. Thank you very much, Brad. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bay. Next, I would like to invite um, Dr. Ko Su Bing, the Malaysia MIRA Committee Chair for the Technical Committee um, 279, ISO 56000. I would like to call upon Dr. Ko to share with us on Malaysia's journey on the ISO 56000. Dr. Ko. Thank you, Dr. Bay, for the kind introduction. Can everyone hear me? Good. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good evening and good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored to have the opportunity to say a few words as the Malaysia ISO 56000 Mirror Committee Chairman at this inaugural IAOIP APU chapter launch. Firstly, I must applaud the foresight and commitment of APU and IAOIP leaderships, Dr. Harry, Prof. Vinesh, Dr. Brad, Rick, and Frank, among others, in making this IAOIP APU chapter a reality. This chapter represents a significant milestone that opens up new opportunities for the APU community and Malaysians to tap into the reservoir of the world-renowned innovation gurus and experts. Innovation do not happen magically by chanting abracadabra, right? No, they are exclusively reserved for that born genius. Instead, innovation needs courage, commitment, a can-do attitude, never give up, and a lot of sweat to persevere through. The good news, like Dr. Brett mentioned, is that innovation is a science you can master and a learnable skill. You just need the right mindsets and attitudes to learn and, more importantly, practice. At the national level, Malaysia is going through the ISO to MS standard adoption process. The draft ISO MS 56002 will be open for public consultation in August and scheduled to be released by end of this year. When ISO 9001 quality standard was introduced in the 90s, it created the demand for quality professionals. I foresee there will soon be demand for innovation management professionals with the release of the MS 56002 Innovation Management Standard. So let's get ready. One of the APU IAOIP chapter's objectives is to work on United Nations SDG theme projects under mentorship by the IAOIP professionals. This is a tremendous opportunity for the professors and students to get involved and create a positive impact. With that said, I urge the professors and students to take full advantage of this very unique setup in enhancing their final year projects and dissertations. For graduating students joining the workforce, analytical skill and innovation are the top number one skill of 2025 as reported by the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs report. So it's time for us to learn the innovation skills from the best, adapt the learnings into the local context, and eventually devise the innovation pathways that are uniquely Asian. 
to innovate, just like what you have heard from Brad. It's like riding a bicycle. It's an experiential learning process. You won't get better by watching other people riding it. Instead, it would be best you ride the bicycle yourself. You need to find your own way of balancing and falling is part of the learning. A journey of about a thousand miles begin with the first step. Now that the riding track is ready, which means that IAOIP APU chapters is there together with the pool of expertise, it is time for the APU community to hop on the bicycles yourselves and start pedaling. Let your creative ideas and innovative solutions take flight. I look forward to hearing success stories from you soon. And you also know that ISO 56002 is real and it's going to be landed in Malaysia and it's going to be a standard by end of this year. With that, all the very best and thank you. Over to you, Dr. Bear. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ko, for sharing with us uh, the very inspiring uh, speech uh, as the chair of the Mira Committee uh, in Malaysia, right? Um, as you said, a journey of a thousand miles start from the very first step. And I suppose we have indeed taken the very first step um, by having this session this evening. Mm -hmm. And of course, having said that, um, we will be moving on um, to our second part um, of the program whereby um, we will have our dear um, instructors or speakers, Frank and Rick from Frank is the chair of the ISO Innovation um, Standards and Rick, the COO of IAOIP, who will be sharing with us some of the inno innovation toolkits and what, how can one learn and pick and mix the right tools and methodology for the right purpose to in innovate. With that, I would like to invite Frank and Rick. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening, good evening, everybody. And good morning to, to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, building on what some of the other speakers had uh, had discussed, uh, we have some exciting things to share with everyone this, uh, this evening about uh, uh, the IAOIP uh, toolkit that we're bringing to the university and also some of the uh, methods and certifications and so forth. And we have some slides to uh, to cover that support our conversations this evening. Yes, Dr. Bay, if you can show the, the slide that I'm sharing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess it's good evening to all of you. It's good morning for us. And uh, thank you very much, uh, all the speakers uh, that we had, Dr. Harry, Dr. Vinesh, uh, Brett, Trusco and uh, and Subang, you've done a great job of of uh, of um, trying to focus what we're trying to do here. Let me uh, let me take a moment here, and then Frank will, will take over in a second. But let me just take a moment here to to uh, e explain a little bit about why we're doing all this and what's what's so different about innovation today versus uh, the serendipitous creativity that many of us think of for, for innovation. Uh, first, you want to, to take, uh, wait, let me see if I can do a laser pointer, here we go. Can that be seen? Yes, it can, okay. So to take the organizational assessment first, because like um, Dr. Har and Dr. Vinesh mentioned strategically, you want to become uh, certified in innovation management. So first you do an assessment. You diagnose then the pain points that you have that, you, that come out of the assessment. You, you create from that a, a better view of the future and what it is that you need to do in order to address those pain points. And then you wanna make sure that you can see around the corner. and. That is not an easy thing to do. You know, you have to do a, uh, an, an, a, um, an inventory of the technology that might be out there, as well as not just technology, but the culture that you have 
and the the um, the way the methodology that you're going to use to manage innovation. I like to I, I like to simplify things always, and and one of the ways that I simplify innovation is uh, or innovation management is to look at value. You want to to focus on the value that you're going to be bringing to to your organization, and so, so it's a value-driven innovation rather than idea-driven innovation. And you try to, to assess um, how well you can get there by maximizing that value. But while you do that, you want to also minimize the risk that you're taking and minimize the resources that you're applying to these, to these innovation efforts. So... Um, you do that through managing it by in a, in a portfolio that gives you the best balance that you can have for the particular set of initiatives that you're working on. This is something that the, the university APU is going to be working on as time goes on, but that sort of simplifies things, right? So let's look a little bit about uh, how does Malaysia uh, compare to, uh, within the global competitiveness report. 2019 is the last time that this report was, was put out due to uh, COVID and so forth. But it looks, it's, it's a very good um, comparison looking at institutions, the infrastructure, the IT, macroeconomic stability, healthcare skills, product market, labor, financial systems, and market size. And then very important for Malaysia, and I'll explain why in a second, is business dynamism and overall innovation capability, okay? What do you mean by capability? Well, there's actually um, a set of, of uh, competencies that you can test for, for, for not only for, the, for a company, but also for individuals. So now the slides are not moving, of course. Why would they? Hmm. So I'm showing everything perfectly, but the slides don't move. Here we go. Okay. All right. So the United States looked at, uh, uh, compares to other countries, 140 in this report, as a number two. We used to be number one for ages. We used to be number one. But other countries have gotten better. And right now, uh, South Korea and um, Indonesia and some of the others, like uh, in Europe, are ahead of the United States in innovation. In total competitiveness, where you look at all the factors that I mentioned, we're still number two, but others are catching up. I don't know what is going on here. Let me try this. Okay, that's another way to do it. All right, so Malaysia uh, is really uh, very competitive if you think about it. Malaysia is number 27 out of 140. But we'd like to, you know, we'll talk about that later, but we'd like to set a goal here where Malaysia can be, uh, let's say, number 20 into, into, uh, into 2030. But how do we get there? And if you look at the, the areas of weakness, right, the areas not necessarily a weakness, but the areas of, best, of, of most opportunity, you have here innovation capability. You're at 55 when uh, other countries are, are much higher. And if you, if you improve this, I'm sure that the the 27th or, you know, goes up to a number 20 very quickly. So uh, I, leave, I leave that to you to think about. I think that Malaysia has not only that capability that, and that it can build it, but it's very strong in macroeconomic uh, stability, very strong, 100. So that gives you the ability to improve the competitiveness of Malaysia versus other countries 
by by looking at the areas that you you know that uh, you have some opportunity in, and we're going to look at that uh, as we go forward. So Frank, uh, let me go to the next slide here if I can. Okay, and okay. Uh, that's yours. Go ahead. So so as uh, as as we were talking, how do we move the needle? How how do we improve uh, the position? Uh, of Malaysia to go from 27th to cracking the top 20 in the next six to seven years or by 2030. Uh, we have a, a slogan that uh, we've created at APU and IAOIP, and it goes, it starts with the professors, that the professors can teach it. They can teach the innovation tools. They can teach the innovation methods. They can uh, talk about and share the innovation stories and case studies. So it's teachable. Uh, the students can learn it. We found this throughout the world in other regions that there's thousands of students are being uh, not only trained in innovation management science, but they're being certified in it so that when they go into the marketplace, the people that are interviewing them and that they're developing a rapport with uh, can recognize their skill sets because they've learned it and they can show it and they can prove it and they're certified. And then the impacts can be felt by the community. Whatever we're doing here, the, one of the essential ingredients is to bring value, community building value here. Now, so how, how do we do it, these three things? How do we teach it? How do we learn it? And how do we determine the impact? Well, uh, we teach it through three systems, a macro system approach, the social system, the technical system, and the which are the tools and techniques, and the management system, which is what we're talking about with the ISO 56000 series. There's eight or nine standards or guidance documents that are being developed in this whole management system to help us manage innovation. We can't box it, but we can manage it. So in teaching it, we focus on the culture and, and we focus on each organization has its own culture. The university has a culture. The students and the student chapters will have a culture. The mirror committees will have a culture. Culture is, is critical. And that's often overlooked when, when we're focusing on the IMS and the implementation of it. So let's take a look at, uh, uh, from the professor's point of view, the key are the 76 tools. Okay, we've, we've published these 76 tools in three volumes. We'll talk about them a little bit later. Uh, okay, the competencies and what our certifications can help bring and what the courses that you're taking and that the experience that you're getting through uh, innovation projects focusing on these six competency areas that Rick will talk about a little bit later when we get into some of the details of it. These six are the fulcrum, the building blocks around which the culture of not only the university and the, and the community ecosystem gets reshaped. Okay, so what's the framework? We call it DDLR, discover, develop, learn, and then show results from it. And, and supporting this DDLR framework, there's 10 uh, pieces of the uh, innovation management system framework that support it. The context of the organization, leadership, planning, that's part of discover. Developing is operational processes and support resources. Learning, we need to evaluate and continuously improve. And then the results, we're talking about process results, portfolio results, and value creation results. These 10 elements and, and the DDLR framework are the heart of not only innovation management system standards, but also the ISO 9001 standard, the ISO 14001 standard. 
18,001, which is for safety. 14,000 I mentioned is for, for environmental uh, improvements and environmental management and greening. And then 9,001 other quality standards. All of these standards have a common framework wrapped around this DDLR, discover, develop, learn, and show results. How do we do this? One of the ways is through our tools. We have 76 tools. The 76 tools are published in a three volume set that we've published with uh, uh, Taylor and Francis and IOIP is one of the, uh, is, is the publisher. Uh, myself and Jim Harrington were the editors of, of the tools. We had tool contributions uh, from uh, 25 different uh, experts around the world. And these 76 tools are baked into the body of knowledge uh, for innovation management systems. Uh, we lost the, uh, the power. No, no, one second, Frank. I'm, I'm going to give you the 76 tools. All right. Dr. Bay, can you share the, I, I'm sharing again. Dr. Bay, hello. Hmm. Okay, All right. I'm we'll, go back. we'll go back to that later, Rick. Okay. All right, we'll go back. Okay, so let's just do a quick focus on these, on a snapshot of these 76 tools. Uh, of these 76 tools, uh, 20 of them, uh, a little more than 20, 22 uh, have been adopted into what we call uh, an innovation toolkit that the university will be using and has started using for its innovation projects. Okay. Um, hold on, Frank. Um, I'm, I'm sharing the screen again that we had before. I don't know why it doesn't show up. I don't know if, if it's something that I need to do or, or what? Yeah, I, I am sharing. I don't know why. Somehow the screen that we had before, where it had two two presenters on the on the left and the screen shared on the right, is uh, what we need. Is Jerry around there? Right. Well, we'll, we'll need to continue, Frank. Uh, they're having yeah. technical issues. Okay. okay. I mean, um, I'm, I'm already sharing, okay? But just so you know. Nobody, you're already sharing, but nobody can see it. Correct. I'm sharing, but somebody needs to, I think it's Jerry, and he's having uh, uh, issues with his connection. So let's, uh, let's, let's us continue. There's nothing I can okay. do. All right, we'll, we'll come back to those tools a little bit later. So, uh, uh, so the next one, pick the up next the next one. slide. Thank you. Yeah, the next slide would be the MITRE Innovation Toolkit Overview. Yeah, we're going to have to come back to that. There's basically 26 tools in the MITRE Toolkit, and uh, they, they're available to our uh, students as well as to our professors to work the innovation projects. We have some maps on how to use which tool, when, 
and which are appropriate and which tools are used in which combinations in order to achieve better results. So often it's not just one tool that's used in one stage, but it's a combination of tools that we use to get the maximum results. And this is what the MITRE, spelled M-I-T-R-E, the MITRE toolkit, that APU, the APU chapter, here it is, we're back up, very good. So here's the 26 tools. Uh, of these 26 tools, 20 of them are from our 76 toolbox, 76 toolkit uh, that IAOIP publishes. And uh, they're outcome focused. So, uh, and, and, and they're good tools and very useful uh, for problem framing, for the mission vision canvas, uh, and uh, for doing uh, pre-mortems as well as post-mortems of projects at the end, but the pre-mortem to diagnose it before you start. And then we have uh, some prototyping. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a template, there's, there's a rosebud template, simplicity uh, doing trimming back and trimming unused features. Then there's in generating, there's some trees tools, there's mind mapping that's very popular, the lotus blossom. We do some body storming. Uh, it's a form of brainstorming. And then we do community mapping when we're scoping and doing a culture, looking at the culture. We have culture building, uh, the stakeholder maps, stakeholders are very important. And then we do a system map. And then finally putting it all together we use the card sorting techniques and uh, the value proposition canvas. And sometimes where there's heavy service uh, applications is we do some service blueprinting. We almost always do personas where we create personas uh, for them. Who's, who are we dealing with in the marketplace? Who's the customer? Who's the stakeholder? So we'll go on to the next one, Rick, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you. Okay. I was going to go into, um, I'm afraid to, to unshare because we had that, that issue, but I, I, I uh, was going to go into the actual um, MITRE toolkit to show them how to use any one of the, well, uh, the, the tools themselves. Why, why don't you reserve that until the end? And that way, if we get if we can't come back, then we can close. Okay. Okay. Good idea. All right. So you're here with the, this, this toolkit here, Frank. Right. So basically uh, the IEOIP and the APU uh, toolkit version will be wrapped around uh, most of the 76 tools are coded to the uh, ISO 56002 five processes, which are identify the opportunities, create the concepts, validate the concepts, develop the solutions, and deploy those solutions. Those five innovation management processes that are showing on the bottom of the screen. The MITRE toolkit has a little bit of a different uh, nomenclature with them. They use define, evaluate, generate, scope, and understand, but we provide translation vehicles uh, for to translate the MITRE toolkit uh, uh, workflow into the ISO 56000 workflow so that we're all working with a common uh, set of tools and a common process wrapped around ISO and ISO 56000. So we can go to the next PowerPoint. Yep. One second. There you go. Okay. So as far as the learning, uh, we're going to be doing a series of creativity and innovation lectures. Uh, that'll be available uh, on the APU website and also on the IAOIP website. So we would encourage everyone to be joining IAOIP. As, as Rick and Brett said earlier, there's a lot of good reasons for it. The journals being one of them and the lecture series. And then we're going to be working with projects around the 17, uh, six of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, final year pro type projects for students that uh, are involved either for their dissertation and the capstone projects. Uh, 
Then we're going to be uh, forming a very solid student chapter network. And we're looking for uh, long term by the end of this year, about 25 uh, students from the student chapter, the IAOIP student chapter. Uh, then we're going to be doing some benchmarking and some industrial visits. Uh, we're going to be benchmarking uh, the best in class and different organizations that have student chapters or different countries so you can learn from each other. And then we're going to be offering uh, what we call certified uh, professional status. There's three or four different levels of that. The basic level, the certified innovation professional. Then we have the, the certified innovation practitioner. And then we have the uh, lead uh, designer for designing and, and deploying innovation systems. You can get certified in that and learn about that. And then you, the final uh, black, uh, master black belt of all of this is the auditor, the lead auditor where you can go in and, and you could be trained to audit companies. Uh, and then we have champions as well that will be uh, certifying. So the students will be heavily involved with the professors. Okay. You want to do that one, Frank? You want me to do it? Go ahead. Pick this one up. <clears throat> okay. So this uh, this screen here has uh, a lot to do with your, your own website. As a matter of fact, this picture here came from your website, and I thought it would be interesting to compare and connect the things that you already do with how uh, this connection that you now have, this partnership that you now have with IOIP, and the development of a new chapter would be uh, helpful to you. So, uh, for example, uh, you, you talk about joint certifications. Well, that's perfect because IOIP has the Certified Professional Innovator, the IMS Practitioner, IMS Design Implementer, IMS Lead Auditor, with Certified Professional Innovator being the key certification that we provide, and the others then supporting the innovation management system. Frank, I think, mentioned some of these already. The other, the other thing is the, the talent development. And with the competency assessments that, that we have, uh, which focus on uh, these six different areas. So I'm going to go over in a second. Uh, you can you can get not only what areas are you strong in, but also what areas you're you're not, and which you need to uh, to improve it. Um, and then lastly, uh, you already de developed here sort of um, an an e innovation ecosystem, okay? Which is what what I'm showing here an example of, where you have your universities. You have your, your you have your universities. You have government, your media, your innovation labs, businesses, and, and uh, foundations, nonprofit also, and then individual entrepreneurs all working together to you know on onto some specific projects and common goals. So that that's a great way to to really build upon the things that you've already you've already started so let's talk a little bit about these these um particular competencies so starting with the first one breaking inertia breaking inertia has to do with with um not doing the same thing always right trying to get away from what what we've always done before and that's part of the competency, and, that, and that's something you can teach, and but it's something you can also, you know, just from experience already have it. Versatility has to do with the ability. Uh, Brett was talking about that, the ability to do more than just one thing, be a, a jack of all trades, so to speak, right? But uh, but you need to then know how to focus that versatility to a specific project but you're versatile you're you're you know we can use you in different in different project teams the next one is is creativity creativity is what everybody thinks about for innovation right you're you're you 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 think outside the box you're always coming up with new ideas you know you you can you can find um opportunities that other people don't even realize are there 
right? Then the other one is the, the ability to innovate the, with, uh, with equipment, with, tech, with technology, have a good handle on new technologies and, and what, what new te technologies can be applied to your particular initiative. The other one is resilience. And resilience is a, is a difficult topic. Um, for example, now when we went through this, this COVID thing, if we were not resilient, if we were not able to change and and adjust and, and adapt and, and basically you know, be like fluid water, right? Where where one day you know you're doing one thing and another day you're doing another because because just things are constantly changing around you, you need to be resilient to be able to to uh, be a good leader and and work on an innovation team. And then lastly, which probably should be the first the most important of them all is the focus on value creation. If you're not creating value with your innovation, then you really don't even have an innovation, okay? By definition, an innovation must be something that is new and novel and that creates additional value, all right? So uh, it's important that you know how to focus on that value creation rather than just the process, okay? So it's very nice to go through a good process, but Unless you have good results from value, you're not really you're, you're really not being innovative. A perfect Rick, example. Go ahead, Frank. Rick, before you move on with this, think of these building blocks as part of your innovation quotient. Just like the the human personality has a has a has an IQ. From the innovation uh, point of view, there's a innovation quotient, and these. The innovation quotient can be enhanced, improved, made better. So you're not born with one innovation quotient or one IQ, and then you're locked into it all your life. You can improve it. You can build on it. There's different combinations of these building blocks that can be used, especially the creativity enhancing one, to build the innovation quotient. Good point. So... When you when you're looking at at your at your competencies, you're not just looking at the competencies themselves and what what's needed for them, but how do you enable innovation with that particular competency? And then, what are the observable behaviors that you have? Uh, it isn't enough just to say, okay, well, I'm competent in creativity, but you have to be able to show that you are creative. Okay, so for every one of these. You need to you need to understand the why. Why are the competencies? There's groups of, of knowledge and skills and, and behaviors, but you also need to know the what. What are the enablers? What are those things that that uh, they represent for to those critical aspects that drive leadership, teamwork, and culture? Okay, and la and then lastly, if it'll if it'll flip, no, it won't. Okay, maybe it'll do it if I do it here. There it is. Um, is the behaviors themselves. So you, you can observe those behaviors. Now, these competencies that I mentioned before, when I said you can measure them, you can me we, we have a system, which we can, we can uh, you know, show you, that you can measure these competencies in a 360 uh, way. 360 meaning not just yourself or what you think of yourself, not a self-assessment, but rather, what does my boss think? What does my peer think? think? What does the person that reports to me think? So you get the view from a 360 degree angle, and then you have a very good uh, measure of, of your competencies. So let's, uh, let's, let's summarize here a little bit, and then Frank will, will close. Um, so the last part of it is the impact. You know, the impact is how does the, the, the project that you're working on, how does it actually uh, affect or gets felt by the community in terms of the SDG goals of the United Nations, which Frank will talk about in a second. The other is, do you have, are you creating industry relevant and innovation competent graduates? I always think of, of a university or any school, okay? Let's say we're talking about a, a elementary school, first through sixth grade, right? So what are you trying to achieve there? Trying to create 
students that are ready to go into the next school, the next school being, you know, middle school, let's say seventh through ninth, right? So that middle school has certain requirements, certain preparation that's required from the elementary school. Well, here, um, instead of being another school necessarily, you're creating students that are able to go into, into their jobs and do a good job, right? So you're creating that for the community that includes the businesses that are going to be hiring them. So there's different types of value. There's, there's value that's important to the students, value that's important to the faculty, the other stakeholders, and the whole ecosystem, as well as any other partners that you have. Okay, uh, Global Innovation Index uh, was uh, what we talked about before, and I think it's important to note that we'd like to set some sort of a goal. We'll agree to that in the, in the chapter with, uh, with APU's leadership to see if we can get all of Malaysia to move from number 27 to somewhere in the top 20 by the end of, uh, of this, uh, I forget the name, by 2030. 2030. Um, lastly, we want to build uh, collaboration and teamwork, entrepreneurial and, uh, and innovation hub and ecosystem if possible. And lastly, to have APU be recognized as a thought leader in data-led innovation. With that, Frank, I leave that up to you. And oops, wrong one, sorry. Sorry about that. This one, go ahead. Yeah. So as far as, uh, uh, what's in it for me and for the APU community? Uh, this is a common set of uh, WIFMs or what's in it for me. The students, the professors, and the staff alike. One is we know that innovation is learning by doing. So we need projects. And we need projects that we have the, the professors uh, leading, the students participating in with community leaders, and these will touch on six of the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we'll be using an innovation charter to scope out uh, the project and to scope it out with community leaders. And this will be very exciting over, over the next six months or so as we get these projects rolling, uh, focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals, six of the 17. Uh, that Dr. Vinesh talked about earlier. Uh, the uh, competitive uh, uh, analysis surveys of WEF say that the number one job skill for 2025, that's the year 2025, is analytical thinking and innovation. A coupling of analytical thinking and the innovation engine. And this is what the projects and the tools and everything that we've been talking about will be centering on, building these job skills, making each of the students more employable, more, more uh, uh, innovation competent, building that knowledge workforce, okay? Uh, enhanced employability, 99% of all of the recruiters throughout the world say that the people that can demonstrate the skill sets that they're looking for have a distinct advantage during the job interview uh, by a four to one or five to one uh, ad advantage. If you can show during the job interviews to the person that's being, uh, uh, that's recruiting, that if you can demonstrate and talk about and relate to them in, in using the innovation tools and the innovation methods and management and the terminologies, it makes you highly employable, much more employable than, than the average student would be. So we're gonna be perfecting a, a, the APU sandbox and the ecosystem by doing a lot of experimentation. And we're gonna be offering some simulations value creating simulations based on on some simulation packages that we're also going to be uh, bringing into the sandbox. Uh, as we said earlier, we're going to be measuring uh, six of the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and the their impact on the community of those six. 
and then enhancing the relevancy and uh, and obtaining more feedback. So the feedback mechanisms are going to be a very important part of what we build in to the chapter and providing feedback on an ongoing basis, a daily, weekly, monthly basis. How are we doing? How can we improve? So we're, we're off to a good start. Why don't we spend about five or 10 minutes since we skipped over it, Rick, see if we can pull up the, um, the MITRE toolkit. Okay. So, so this is the, the, again, the MITRE toolkit that we had before. And what I'll do now is, uh, or do we want to show the, the, the extent of the 76 tools, Frank? Uh, I know we can get into the MITRE toolkit. I've, I've got it here, but let's try to show, show that, that listing that I was not able to show before. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's see here. Stop that screen. Okay. Okay, it's there now. So, Jerry, could you bring that up? Perfect. Love it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, go ahead, Frank. Yeah, so what, what we did is, is we took uh, a whole set, uh, multiple sets of tools that innovators have used, the uh, IOIP uh, Tools and Methods Committee, and we boiled it down from 150 tools, or actually it was over 200 to start with. It was about 220 to 230 tools. We got it down to 150. And then we, we had the, the experts vote on the most useful tools versus primary, secondary, and tertiary usefulness. And, and the result of all, and then we mapped it, the results became 76 tools. So of those 76 tools, the ones in yellow here have been incorporated into the MITRE toolkit. Right. So, let's, let's be clear. The, the, the ones that have yellow rows, right, that, that have correct. a yellow row here. Yeah. Okay. The, the yellow not row where it says yes to the tools, right? Yeah, not necessarily yellow here. Right. right. So if we go back to the top for a minute, and we have affinity diagramming, which is also known as card sorting. So MITRE has a, has a, a nice tool for doing that, for doing the card sorting. And then we have the... Uh, Brett talked about it a little bit earlier, the biomimicry, uh, mimicking the biosphere and what's going on in nature and so forth. And, and we, there's a version of that in the MITRE toolkit called body storming. Okay. And then we have uh, the brain writing tools. And then uh, we also have the, uh, the consumer uh, focused community mapping. How do we map out the consumer community? and look at the customer journeys and see see how all that is experiencing itself out using a tool. Well, that's community mapping. And then we have comp uh, creative problem solving uh, uh, tool for problem solving. We have design uh, 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 tools called trimming that we can trim back the features using the MITRE toolkit. Then we have a few more. We have the... Uh, uh, the nice tool called the influence channeling, and then we have identifying and engaging stakeholders. The Lotus Blossom is one of the most popular, uh, uh, popularly used tools. The most popular one is the mind mapping tool. Uh, that's used by more teams and more people than any one single tool. Uh, we have culture, a canvas. How do we diagnose the culture? How do we pull it apart. How do we look at it and see what makes the culture tick? We have uh, plan, do, check, act as, as a tool, robust design, and so forth. So there's a lot of tools. And the mapping of the tools to the right show it, the tool's impact on the particular uh, part of the innovation management operations uh, standard called 56002. There's five processes of five five uh, operation zones. There's the zone of identifying opportunities, 
And then there's the zone of creating concepts, validating concepts, developing solutions, and deploying solutions. And we gave scores on a one to five scale, one being low or non-existent rather. And, and there aren't too many ones. Most of these tools have a place somewhere all the way up to a five, which is the highest impact and the most, most used and the most valued. And then we color coded them to make them easy to, uh, to see where the tools are uh, coming in into play. So we have this whole toolkit that we're going to be refining let with me, ABU. Let me, let me add something here. So one of the things that's important here is the, the key word here is navigator. So re, depending upon what, what process you're in, okay, like if you're in Create Concepts, you go down that column, and those that have the green, which is the highest correlation, are the ones that are the tools that are best used for creating concepts. So this navigates you. This this helps you identify which tool is best to use in what particular part of, of the uh, innovation process. Okay, so yeah. th that's the value. Go ahead, Frank. Good point. So let's, so let's do a little bit of a dive. We have uh, about five minutes remaining for this part. So let's look at the MITRE toolkit for a minute. Which one, which one do you think we should go uh, for? Let's do the uh, the card sorting one. It's up on the screen. We the affinity diagram. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Let's go look for miter, which is here, or any of them. It, it, we're just yeah, illustrating. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. matter. I'm just trying. I'm just trying to make sure I got the right one here. I've only got four four screens to show. All right. So Jerry, can you show that one, please? Thank you. All right. So the the MITRE toolkit, what I did not check, Frank, is is that one under the one you want? Is that under scope? Let, let's just it? open up the find and, uh, and and we'll pull the first one that comes up under yeah under the find. Yeah. So you have mission yeah. vision pre So let's the problem framing. Problem framing. That's one of the more useful tools. Okay. Okay, so every tool has the same uh, uh, nomenclature. It has, if you scroll up a little bit first before you show the tool, now scroll up back to the top. Yeah, scroll up. Problem framing. Every tool, whether it's problem framing or the card sorting or anything, it says what is it, why use it, and when to use it. So it, it answers those three questions, okay, to start with. It tells you the level. This is a beginner level tool and it tells you the outcome and helps us define the group size. You can use it with two or more people and the suggested time, it gives you some benchmarks for time. Here it's 45 plus minutes, the average problem framing canvas. Okay, so then they give you the, the, an example of the, of the problem framing canvas and then there's a downloadable version of it for the students and the professors and so forth to use as part of the, the project. It, it, it lists out the benefits and the challenges of using it. Okay. And then if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see what you combine it with. Well, it, it gives you some hints. It's the combinations of tools. We can combine this with Lotus Blossom to take each piece of the Lotus Blossom. And as we pull it apart, uh, problem framing becomes very, very important. Uh, we can combine it with stakeholder identification, or we can combine it with one of the trees, TRIZ, inventive problem solving tools. Yeah, okay. and, and you don't, this is not limited, right? They're just giving you some advice right. as to what makes sense, right? So, and they also give you examples. So yep. there's always, for every tool, there's examples provided. And then if you want to know more about the tools, there's additional resources or additional reading. And then there's the steps. Each tool has steps, five steps, four steps, six steps, okay? And questions to ask, a question bank on each tool. Every one of them has questions. And then how to facilitate it for the instructors, 
and for the facilitators on the teams, there's facilitation tips. So there's there's very there's a very deep dive for each of the 26 tools, depending on which tools that you choose to use. And then if you need help using this tool with your team, you can contact IAOIP and we'll be mentoring the teams and we'll be happy to uh, to to provide instruction and some instructor manuals and so forth. So this MITRE toolkit is going to be very valuable as we start to launch these uh, projects for the team. Yep. So uh, at this point, I think we're we're done with the presentation, but we are open to questions. If anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Frank and Rick, uh, for sharing with us. Um, it's definitely um, very exciting. Um, I can definitely re relate, right? Um, especially the, the demo on the, one of the meter uh, kit, uh, toolkit earlier on, uh, the problem framing uh, canvas. I guess uh, it just, um, the, the canvas just um, come arrive uh, timely, um, whereby I was basically speaking to a few of, 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 of my students, right? Um, Basically, I'm um, trying to explain, or rather, um, to explain to them um, where can we actually identify and you know um, to really um, address a problem, a particular problem statement statement better. So I guess the problem framing canvas is timely, and I, I can definitely see it being very useful for our students uh, as a start, um, where you know um, they can try to to populate the canvas and, you know, try to test out whether or not uh, it helps them to to figure out uh, in terms of their project's requirement and how to utilize the toolkit better. Yeah, right. Dr. Bay, um, Frank sort of mentioned that. I think I think uh, Brett would have would have also mentioned that if uh, if we could have seen his slides, because I, I know they were there, but there's three volumes of of these tools that Frank explained. OK. Those 76 tools that, that, it, that we mentioned, there's three volumes that are, are still available in Amazon, okay, that go through the different tools, okay? And they're, they're, they're all called the Innovation Tools Handbook, Volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3. And uh, that might be something that you might want to have for your library, you know, for the APU library. Um, and then you could use, uh, you know, you could see all the tools there. Yeah, I, I think that's... That's going to be a very useful resource that we could add to the library. Yeah. So um, I just have one more question. Um, just I I just wonder if there is any um particular toolkit that is um specially designed uh when we deal with certain sectors of innovations. Um, is that how it's going to work um for the innovation toolkit, or we are open to pick and choose which one. Uh, that will work for us. There's well, always, gonna, go, go ahead, Frank. Go ahead. We're going to be developing a, a sector-specific series of tools and schemes, uh, APU and IOIP, with uh, Dr. Subang uh, that will answer that question. We'll have them targeted for different sectors. We have, we have of the 40 or 39 universal market sectors will pick the top five or ten and then we'll develop a specific targeted toolkit for that particular sector apu will interesting thanks for sharing with us on on, on that uh, development um i i have another question um i know we speak we talk a lot about you know um doing uh, projects that are related to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and try how we can align uh, the project outcomes along that 17 goals. Uh, but I have one question at the back of my mind is that um, what are the available um, resources or tools out there um, that can that our students or as a, a researcher at a university can use it um to try to estimate whether or not that we are on the right track right when we are curating a certain project yeah there's one of the tools that is in our toolkit 
Uh, if you want to call it back up, Rick, it's the second tool number two. It's called the 76 uh, uh, possible solutions. Okay. Are you saying within our within our our within handbook? The 70, within the the 76, 76 tools, one of the 76 tools, tool number two on the list. Yeah, I got it. I'll, I'll show it in a second. This, this is found in handbook number three of the three handbooks that were referenced uh, containing the 76 tools. Tool number, tool number two uh, is found in volume three, the creative tools. It's called 76 Standard Solutions. And that tool explains how you can map against 76 standard solutions to try to see what the potential might be and so forth for that particular solution. It's, it's kind of like a good starting place if you're looking to put things into a compartment and it's one of the 76 tools. Yeah, uh, Brett has something to say. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Jerry, can you add Brett to the, to the picture here? Oh, he's not there now. Oh, well. Okay. Well, Brett said, Brett, wanted, I'll, I'll explain what he was saying. There he is. Okay. Right. No, I wanted to add that uh, uh, we built a training deck for educators and or preferred training providers to help people prepare for the certification exam. It's over 2,500 slides. And uh, anybody who's uh, a professor knows that 2,500 slides, you, you probably, uh, it's almost as good as gold. Um, so we have those available to our educator providers like APU. Uh, obviously, it can always be better. And so um, it, it's available if anyone on the call, uh, please don't share it because our preferred training providers, we actually make them pay to acquire the deck but it, it's definitely available for our education partners, especially if they contribute and make it better. Yeah, good point. Okay, so All right. Dr. Dr. Bay, I'll, I'll, you know, we punt to you, see which, uh, which, which one to do next. Yeah. So I guess uh, thanks very much uh, um, to all of you, uh, to Prof. Brad, um, to Frank and Rick as well um, for sharing with us um, the different toolkits that are available out there. And right. we definitely look forward, I mean, to, to some of the projects that we can work together uh, by using these, these toolkits. And we will definitely reach out uh, to, to IAO IP for further guidance and, you know, any assistance that we value. Okay. So with that, Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. Everyone have a great evening. Dr. Bay, I'd like to thank you for all your efforts in putting this together. Dr. Yeah, Manish, Dr. Hari. And especially, I want to take a special uh, mention to uh, Dr. Subang. Okay. Uh, he was very instrumental in getting, you know, coordinating all this on the, on, on the back end and making sure that it all happened. So thank you, Subang. Indeed. Thank you very much to all the speakers for the day. And I look forward to be working more closely with all of you. Mm -hmm. With that, um, thank you very much to our audience as well. Okay. Um, thank you for dialing in and have a good evening and a very good start over there in the US um, to Frank and Rick. Okay. Bye bye. Um, just one last um, note here before uh, we, we wrap up the sessions. Um, for the audience, um, you may actually send the, scan the QR code for your digital certificate if you would like to have one. Um, my colleague now has um, shared the screen with a QR code for your scanning if you'd like to receive a copy of a digital certificate.
Okay. With that, thank you very much and have a good evening, everyone. Goodbye.